Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Brian Rampersand, and I'm going to present uh, our paper, Shepherd Seamless Stream Processing on the Edge. And this paper was presented at the 7th ACM slash uh, IEEE Symposium on Edge Computing in Seattle in December of 2022. Okay, so what is stream processing? Stream processing is an approach to data processing whereby we process data in real time. And so these applications uh, can be structured as a graph of operators. So the way this works is that we have uh, data sources, we have transformation operators, and we have sinks, which essentially store final results. And as data arrives at the sources, it gets passed through the graph. Um, so for example, here we have this uh, sensor application um, and it reads uh, readings from sensors and it does some analytics on them. So as each uh, tuple is passed through the graph, it gets transformed. So we summarize the data and then we store the final result. And collectively together, these uh, components make up a stream processing application. So what are the challenges with processing data? So today we're sending all of our data back to the cloud. So we can see here in this example that we have a data source, which is a camera. Uh, we have a phone and a car. And so the camera is sending video frames, the phone is sending text data, and the car is sending location-based information, which is numeric. And so the problem with this is as the user base grows, so does the amount of transmitted data. And so when we transmit uh, more data, it can become costly. And so for certain applications, such as our video processing application, um, it becomes even more costly than the other applications just because video frames are much larger than text-based data. So uh, what can we do about this cost? So an alternative approach to send everything back to the cloud is to use a hierarchical stream processing approach. So we can see here, we can organize a series of data centers into a hierarchical network using an overlay network. So here we have a wide area cloud. We have uh, smaller regional data centers, city uh, and city level data centers, uh, which would be even smaller. And so we would send these uh, video frames to the local city level data centers. So um, we have this example application here, which is a, a road traffic monitor application that counts cars, and it consists of three different operators. So we have our filtering operator, which filters out video frames that don't have cars um, because we don't want to perform costly object detection on them, which is the next operator. And then finally, after we detect the number of cars in the frame, uh, we store the final uh, results in a statistics operator. And so um, we can deploy this application in the cloud and uh, partition the filter operator onto the edge. So the effect of this is that um, the video frames are being uh, filtered out at the edge if they are of no interest. So we reduce the amount of video frames being sent back to the wide area cloud processing and we will save money for that reason. So the economic uh, case for hierarchical stream processing is mainly due to variable workloads. And so this, uh, cost chart here shows the uh, different uh, deployment types. So first we have a cloud only deployment. So we can see here for our uh, smart traffic monitoring application uh, over a 10 hour period, we have peaks and valleys. So the peaks are essentially with high traffic, we have more cars uh, we need to count and so we need to do more object detection and we're setting more video frames to the cloud. So in this case, we're setting all video frames. So we're not filtering anything out of the edge. So we have very cheap uh, compute costs in the cloud, but very high bandwidth costs because we're sending everything to the cloud. So an alternative to this is to deploy all of your compute um, here seen on the green line uh, at the edge. And so all of the data arrives at the edge and we process it. So the problem with this is that edge resources are more expensive uh, compute resources than cloud compute resources, just because you don't have the same economies of scale. So even though you're saving on the bandwidth, the uh, compute cost is high. So a third approach is an adaptive approach. And so the adaptive approach has further cost savings, as you see here on the red line, because it trades off uh, the cost between compute and bandwidth. So uh, for example, if the bandwidth is very low, then we can send things to the cloud. Uh, <clears throat> where the traffic is very low, we can send things to the cloud. And when traffic is very high, we do processing on the edge. So this requires us to be able to uh, deploy operators and undeploy them. Uh, according to the workload profile, so we can save the most money. So how does the adaptive edge approach? Um, so in this example here, we have our application that's running, and we're sending video frames uh, to the City2 data center, and they're being filtered there. So what happens if a uh, camera detects cars in City3? So here we don't have any F operator installed, and so 
the data is just being sent back to the cloud. So we're not doing any filtering. So this is like the highest cost because um, you know we're sending useless data to the cloud potentially. Um, and so uh, an approach to the adaptive uh, edge is to be able to uh, install the F operator. And so we can now do some filtering in that city level uh, data center, city three, and we can reduce the amount of data being sent back. So what are the challenges with having an adaptive system? Uh, so this uh, chart here shows the tuples per second. So that's the throughput of the application uh, for an existing stream processing framework, uh, Apache Storm. And so we can see here at uh, the 100 second mark, whenever we want to do an F operator installation, the system goes down. So you're changing the job. And so in this chart, we can see here that we have significant throughput drops. So whenever we're going through a reconfiguration, the application stops uh, to place the new operator and this causes downtime. So we can see here that the drops are uh, occurring every time we want to add a new F operator to different edges. And then we have this peak, which is essentially the backlog that needs to be cleared uh, while the job was stopped. So we can see that this is very disrupted and for certain applications, uh, they're not able to tolerate this level of disruption. So we can see that existing systems are not adequate. And so we can say that uh, reconfiguration is a stop the world event. And so um, we saw there that the uh, you know, throughput drops because the system needs to do reconfiguration. And this is due to an early binding design. This is because uh, operators have direct socket connections between each other. Um, so this means that an operator needs to have knowledge of where another operator is. And if you change that assumption, essentially, if you want to remove an operator or place it somewhere else, you need to rebuild all of the socket connections. And that takes a lot of time. And as well, we have global cluster synchronization. So uh, in distributed systems, whenever you have a job running on multiple machines and multiple data centers, they need to synchronize between each other to make sure the job state is ready for example, to process new data and to keep consistent state. And so all of these synchronization operations take time and leads to uh, more downtime. And so an alternative approach uh, is a late mining approach, and this is Shepard, and I'm going to describe how this works. So we use a, a series of software routers in each data center. So this decouples the transport layer from the operator uh, themselves. So there's no direct socket connections. So we uh, deploy these operators at each data center in a hierarchical fashion, whereby the edge uh, is the uh, closest point to the user where the data is being generated. And this data gets progressively pushed up towards the cloud uh, where the uh, full application would be running an operator instance. So using this uh, software uh, router design, using a hierarchy, uh, we can independently add operators at runtime. So here we can see we're adding our F or O and their A operator, and then they can communicate through the router. And so in this example here, as the tuple arrives at the edge data center, each router just makes a binary decision whether to process locally or to pass that tuple up to the parent. So here we can see that there's no F operator to process that green tuple. And so every time it gets pushed up, it goes through the same binary decision and it gets uh, passed to the uh, parent child uh, data center. So uh, we can see here at the cloud that the uh, F operator has been found. And so the tuple will be processed here. So this approach allows us to be able to add this F operator, for example, to the core data center at runtime. And so whenever the next tuple arrives, it arrives at the edge data center. It doesn't find an F operator there, but now when it hits the core data center, it is able to find that F operator and it can uh, be processed at the core level. So this approach allows us to add and remove uh, operators at runtime without stopping the job. And so we make the assumption currently that all applications are stateless. So sta stateful operators are the um, point of future work. So let's see the reconfiguration in action. So as I mentioned, we have this router network between the edge core and cloud data center, and we're passing the tuples up. So when we wanna do a reconfiguration, we add the operator, uh, but it is not connected to anything else. So we can see here that the tuples are still flowing towards the cloud. So we add queues to feed that operator. And then we add uh, connections so that the F operator can uh, pass data to these queues. Um, so next we add a routing rule. And so when the uh, F operator is ready to see tuples, the data arrives at the F operator and it has its output, which sends its output to the O operator through the router network. So this uh, reconfiguration um, allows the uh, system to be able to add the F operator here without uh, shutting down the flow of data. 
Next, how do we optimize this further? So what are the challenges with the late binding approach? First, we have Java cold start. Uh, so Shepard is uh, written in Java, and so Java um, basically starts off slow. So this is mainly due to the way Java is designed uh, because the JIT needs time to optimize the code. So in the initial stages uh, of the application, it's not processing data as quickly, and then eventually it does the optimization and it can process tuples much faster. And as well, we have router overhead. So as I mentioned that we have uh, potentially multiple operators deployed in the same data center and they are communicating through the router. But the router uh, essentially has to deal with a lot of traffic and the more traffic you give it, it slows it down. So this is a potential bottleneck for the system. So first, how do we minimize Java cold start? So as I mentioned in the previous example here, we have this router network where everything is being sent to the cloud. And so tuples flow through the router queue, we start our F operator, we add our new operator queue and we connect it to both. So the difference now is that we add this dual root. And so the purpose of this dual root is to send a sample of the data stream to the F operator, such that we can warm up that operator while still communicating the data to the cloud so we can make progress on the stream. And only once the uh, F operator is ready, do we remove the dual root and then the data only flows to the F operator on the edge and it sends its output to the O operator. So the implication of this is that the F operator is not joining the data stream in a cold manner. So it has a sample, so it's able to process data as quickly as an operator that had been running previously. And so this uh, gives us more of a seamless transition towards uh, reducing a throughput disruption. So how do we optimize the router overhead? So uh, for this example, we have a very simple setup. We have a cloud and an edge data center with our two software routers. We have our A operator, which is our final statistics operator, and we have our F and O operator on the edge. So we know that the uh, routers are very good for moving data across wide area network. They have features that uh, handle high network latency and as well as disconnection. Um, so when we connect them uh, directly together, the operators, we uh, add extra traffic to these routers, which is not ideal. And so this creates overhead. And so an alternative approach is to allow for hybrid connectivity. This uh, allows us to uh, have the F operator communicate directly with the operator, effectively bypassing the router um, and being able to more efficiently send data to the O. So the key point here and the important point is that we have hybrid connectivity, which allows us to maintain our ability to late bind operators to the network. So we can add operators to the network without shutting down the job. Um, but also having the advantage of being able to uh, send data directly to where it's needed. So now I'm gonna talk about how we conducted our evaluation of Shepard. So first I'll talk about the experimental setup that we have. So we created an emulated edge network on Amazon consisting of four different data centers with variable network latency. So we have North California as the root of our hierarchical data center structure. And we have Oregon, Ohio, and Virginia as our edge data centers. So we can see here that we have a variable network latency where Oregon is 22 milliseconds of network latency compared to Virginia. And this is because Virginia is much further away from North California as compared to Oregon. So we have four applications that we use in our evaluation. First, we have our ETL application, which is a, the RIT benchmark, which is a widely used benchmark that uh, contains smart building data that I showed earlier, where we have sensor information such as temperature and humidity, and it does some analytics on that information. Next, we have our Twitter sentiment analysis application that parses tweets, and it essentially looks at the tweets and the words and assigns a positive or negative score to the tweet based on those words. And as well, we have our object detection application that we've been talking about. So this is the smart traffic monitoring application. And so we have two versions of this application, the light and the full. The difference between them is that the light version doesn't contain the object uh, detection uh, payload uh, dependency inside the payload. And so the reason uh, that we have this uh, augmented version is that they have different sizes in terms of the application executable. So we can see here the live version is only 300 megabytes approximately, and the full is uh, about a gigabyte, which is very large. And so the implication is this, uh, whenever you want to deploy an operator in a different data center, you must upload that application executable to be able to process the data. And so if it's larger, it's going to take more time uh, to download that operator code. So we'll see uh, later on in the experiments how this impacts the reconfiguration time. 
So first, uh, let's look at a reconfiguration in the LAN. So this is um, the best possible scenario for frameworks that have um, you know, been designed to work inside data centers with no network latency. So in this experiment, we uh, examine the throughput impact of a reconfiguration, and we use the Twitter application. Again, we are counting uh, you know, the number of words uh, in terms of the positive or negative and giving it a score. And so in this scenario, we have an emulated edge network with uh, no network latency, as I mentioned. And so we are just adding um, different F operators to different machines. And so we do go through five different reconfigurations. So uh, this is the result here of the throughput comparing uh, Apache Storm with Shepard. And so for Storm, we can see whenever we add one of these edge data centers, we get significant throughput drops. Um, so every uh, point here at 100, 298, 496, and 694, we can see that the system goes down and the job is not processing uh, tuples, so the throughput drops. And then whenever it comes back online, we get these large spikes. So for this application, um, you know, this may not necessarily be desirable to have this kind of disruption. So in contrast to this uh, performance for reconfiguration, we have Shepard, which we can see here, it doesn't have those throughput drops. So whenever we add those F operators for Shepard, it's able to maintain um, the throughput in a stable manner, reacting to the increase in traffic. So our takeaway here is that we have no throughput drops for Shepard due to the uh, late binding design. So now let's take a look at the reconfiguration on the WAN. So in this uh, example here, we have uh, four applications and we uh, measure the job downtime or reconfiguration. So in each application scenario, we deploy a new operator instance to one edge. So here are the results. So we can see that network latency increases the downtime. So uh, remember that each one of those edge data centers has a different amount of network latency because they're of a dis different distance from the root data center where the application is being deployed from. So in the example here, the object detection full for storm, we can see the bigger the application, the, sorry, the further the distance, the longer it's going to take uh, for it to um, reconfigure the job. So we have higher downtime. So we can see here in the blue bar and the orange bar and the green bar, uh, depending on how far away it is, um, sending that gigabyte is going to take longer than it is in other data centers. And so we can also say that the larger the application executable, the longer the downtime. So for example, here for Storm, we see we have the ETL application. Um, it's very low regardless of which data center you're sending it to because the, um, you know, the application executable is much smaller. I think it's like 50 uh, megabytes that we showed earlier as compared to like the one gigabyte. So the impact is, is, is lower. But for Shepard, we can see here the impact is consistently low. And so we can say that uh, Shepard is not impacted by the WAN latency or the application executable size. And this is because of the uh, late binding design where we showed that we can uh, add the operator and set up all the queues and essentially do all the steps required to do the re reconfiguration uh, before we actually do the transition. And so that transition is very short, it's 50 milliseconds. So um, it's independent of the application size or the network latency. So now let's look at the uh, impact of cold start. So as I mentioned earlier, Java uh, is very slow to start. And so uh, in this experiment here, we have our Twitter application as our example. And our scenario is we're adding a filtering operator to, uh, to remove tweets that aren't of interest. So this is the reconfiguration where we add that F operator. And so for the results, uh, it shows that whenever we have uh, the warm-up feature turned off, we essentially uh, have significant uh, throughput disruption. So we can see here that whenever um, you know, we don't have that feature turned on at the 50 millisecond mark, we get this uh, drop and then a return, which is a spike. But if we warm up our operators first before sending the data to it, it behaves just like a, an operator that's existed previously and is warmed up and there is no throughput disruption. So we can say that uh, Java cold start can be mitigated by warming up operators. And so the, next let's look at our uh, hybrid op optimization impact. So as I mentioned, we have that hybrid connectivity where we can bypass the router. And so um, our example application here, we use uh, our ETL application, which is the smart billing data. And we examine three different throughput levels. So we have 1,200 tuples per second, 1,600, and 2,000 tuples per second. So for these results, we can see if we only use the router to communicate within the same data center, 
there's significantly higher latency. And this is due to the fact that the router is being overworked. We're sending it more data uh, than it's uh, than is necessary. And so it has to work harder. And so it'll process things much slower. But if we bypass the router when we need to within the same data center using our hybrid connectivity, we get lower tuple latency. So we can see here that the tuple latency stays relatively low and consistent for the different throughput levels. So our takeaway is that hybrid connectivity um, can reduce latency. And so in summary, we can say that uh, existing approaches do not support seamless reconfiguration. This is due to global coordination and early binding. We presented Shepard, which supports seamless reconfiguration, uses a network of routers, and we applied two optimizations. First, we have the hybrid connectivity, which uses direct connections and the router network for operators to communicate. And as well, we introduced a warm-up feature to handle Java cold start. So for future work, we plan to do uh, stateful operators, and we plan to address fault tolerance. And so this concludes my talk, and I'll take any questions. Thank you very much.